So today we have uh, John Pritchett here. He was uh, an undergrad student in Cambridge at the time he left me. And then he moved to Caltech uh, to work with um, Mark Minkowski and finished his PhD in 2007. And now he's a uh, Hubble IPC fellow in Harvard. And uh, today he will talk, uh, tell us about how to explore uh, the dawn of structure and design one centimeter. Thank you, Jens. It's a, a pleasure to visit Toronto for the first time. Yeah, so I, a lot of my work focuses on trying to understand the theory of the 21 century design and understanding how to connect these kind of observations that people are building or proposing for the future to observations of the early universe. Uh, and I'll talk about work with a variety of collaborators, especially with Harvey Lowe and Steve Lowe. So modern cosmology has done this very good job of giving us a broad brush outline evolution of the universe uh, from the very early universe as seen in the cosmic micro backpack with many small fluctuations that we believe to grow into the galaxies that we see later on in, in telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but our understanding of the first billion years of that evolution is essentially a blank. Uh, our observations tend to end at about a redshift of 6.5 or so when realization is either ended or just in the process of ending. And so we can kind of break up this period before the end of realization in these different places. The cosmic micro backgrounds that we observe and understand very well. The cosmic dark ages where structures are growing but before the first galaxies have actually formed. The cosmic dawn when one of the, the very first galaxies form. And then realization where ionized bubbles surrounding clusters of galaxies merge, overlap, and the entire universe becomes ionized. Um, and so this really uh, marks the limit of current observations. And in this talk, I'll discuss some of the current probes of reionization, and then talk about the 21 centimeter signal, the basic physics, and then two aspects, the global signal of the 21 centimeter fluctuations, and describe what we might be able to learn about astrophysics using them. And so it's very customary in talks on reionization to show this cartoon, uh, this picture. Uh, and I like it because it always reminds me of this New Yorker cartoon. It's very detailed down here, and it gets very simple as you get up here. You know, anyone that's been to California knows that there's a lot going on up there. And, and to me, this, this is cause for hope, that you know, things far away look simple because we don't know very much. But as we learn more, our very basic questions now have become more sophisticated questions. So there's a lot to learn. And while it's difficult to make predictions about the future, it's safe to say that the next 10 years are going to be a very exciting time for this field, because there are many new, different observations about things like JWST, Alma, and 21 century experiments. So just to, to drive home the, uh, the degree of ignorance that we have about the first billion years, uh, one can ask questions about just two simple properties of the gas that fills the universe, the gas temperature and the ion extraction. And so here I'm plotting as a function of ratio how these, these quantities might evolve. So we have measurements of the cosmic micro background, the redshift of a thousand, which are telling us when the universe becomes neutral, when recombination happens. Uh, and you know, from that we know something about the, the temperature of the gas at that point. We also have observations of uh, absorption lines on the, the weight of quasars, um, which tells us that the universe is mostly ionized at redshifts below six or so. But we know essentially nothing about the details of what went on between those two points. And I can draw these curves which span there are many orders of magnitude, but there's no observation of them. So it's sort of safe to say that we know very little that's concrete about this period. And that's because we know very little about the properties of galaxies and redshifts greater than the next or so. And so one of the hopes is that observations of the 21 centimeter line can begin to fill in this region of ignorance from the point when the gas first thermally decoupled from the CMD through to the point where the universe became fully ionized. So we can learn about broad picture questions like this. Another thing that we'd like to learn is understanding reionization is, is quite a complicated uh, process. We have this theoretical picture that density fluctuations uh, created after inflation grow over time Galaxies form at the, the dense peaks of the density distribution. And as those galaxies produce photons, they ionize regions around these sort of large bubbles. Uh, and so we, we'd like to understand that process. But we're hampered by the fact that the field of view of telescopes like Hubble are very small compared to the sort of sizes of the ionized bubbles that we expect. So we need other observations 
thing size of 21 centimeter long, that give us a big picture view of what's going on that we can put together with the galaxies to complete the picture. Or so I'll like it. So I'd just like to begin by uh, recapping some of the pros of the epoch organization to get a sense of what we know at the moment. Uh, so the sort of the most robust probe that we have is the cosmic micro background. So here you're, you're looking for the 10% or so of cosmic micro background photons that scatter off the ionized plasma in the universe after reionization is completed. And we measure that as an, an optical effect. Uh, Planck, uh, for the next couple of years, will improve the error bars on that value by factor of three or so. But this is really one number, and we want to use it to constrain a, an entire uh, reionization history, which is a function of ratio. So there are many different models that can give the same, same value. You can imagine that reionization occurs instantaneously, in which case this would constrain it, it occur at some like ratio to 11 or so. But if you allow it to be uh, extended, so if it ionizes up to some ionized fraction of redshifts above 7 and then fully ionized below that, then your error regions open up quite considerably. Uh, so this tells you something about the duration of reionization, but not a great deal. So we also have observations of the line map forest. So the power spectrum also tells you that this should have been tried in any There's some bits of older and new that these series That's right. right uh, so a principle you can measure you know, between two and five numbers that tell you something about exactly when the realization is happening. At the moment, the w map is only really giving you one, maybe two numbers, and that one number is essentially the optical depth. Planck will do a little better. Yeah, that's right. So Planck will measure us with five numbers? I think about five numbers. Uh, I forget exactly. And that, you know, that's, that's telling you something about when the midpoint of realization is. Well, the shape of the and, Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So properties of the shape. Like instantaneous, you mean instantaneous turn on and off. I mean, my life. Right? I mean, like that, the universe went from being neutral to being an So instantaneous. Yeah, so there's hope for further CMD experiments to be on that. Uh, so we also have measurements of the, the line map of forest. So here you have a, a very bright quasar, and you're, look, you're observing absorption by dense hydrogen clumps along the line of sight, and that produces this forest of lines. So in, what one can do is measure the transmittance of line alpha photons, and then if you make assumptions about the properties of the intergalactic medium, you can link that to the ionizing background of that. The ionizing background was higher, there'd be less neutral hydrogen, and so you'd see more line on the uh, But that's quite an uncertain connection. Uh, you can make more assumptions and connect that ionizing background to the rate at which sources are actually producing the ionizing photons. Uh, and maybe if the sources at redshift less than six are the same as those at redshift greater than six, you can use this to begin to constrain some of the ionizing. Can you say a few more words about uh, how that the transmit is the yeah, sure. So uh, the temperature density relationship comes in here. So you're assuming that the gas is in photoionization equilibrium. So you fix the ionizing condition background, and then you've got some recombination rate, which is determining the, the fraction of neutral hydrogen that's left. So the recombination rate is quite sensitive to the, the temperature. Uh, uh, I forget which way it goes. But so you're, what you're measuring is the statistics of these, these lines. Um, and you know, that's also where the, the density PDF comes in, I guess, that you're, you know, where you have denser regions, you'll get more neutral hydrogen. So, so, so the assumptions that you make about those determine so how you interpret it. So you assume a density density relation. Assume a temperature density relation. That's right. Given the density relation. That's right. That's right. And, and often a, a power law is assumed that there's been a lot of work to do with people in the ionization. Uh, so if, as you go to higher redshifts where there's more hydrogen present, that forest of lines disappears and you get left with just a trough where the gum pieces can drop. And that's telling you that the neutral fraction has risen above the level of about 10 to the minus 3 or so. So the problem is that at this point, you're essentially seeing those flux. So it's very hard to push this uh, technique to higher redshifts to learn what's really going on during realization. 
And it's also complicated by the fact that it depends upon the line of sight. So if you're looking at a quasar and it's mostly a neutral gas along that line of sight, the spectra will look very different than if you're looking at a quasar where it's mostly along through ionized gas. Uh, so those are the sort of three observations that we really have. And what you'd like to do is to you know, put those together and constrain some model. So to do a kind of classic Bayesian inference problem where you have some model for reanalyzation, you've got some data, you constrain some model parameters, and then once you know, constrain those model parameters, you can say what the reanalyzation is here. So if you looked at the evolution of the fraction of ionized gas, that's driven by an ionization rate, which the line out for us says something about and recombinations, which uh, you can attempt to model, and then you can apply the CMB optical depth constraint. Uh, so you can play that game. And unfortunately, the quality of the data that we have at the moment is such that there's really only three sort of broad statements that one can draw. That the universe was probably ionized by a redshift of you know, somewhere between 6 and 8. The midpoint of reionization is around 9 to 11. And that reionization could be an extended process. So it can have a tail that goes up to redshift to 15. And you know, as data gets better, it will become more important to put these different observables together. So you have the, have the observation in the extended, or does it require a pair of extended? Uh, like you say, you already rule out the possibility that it's almost a set function? No, I mean, you can see models that are you know, close yeah. to being set functions. So it is a yeah. Even Even that's a lot. Being extended is not known. It, 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 so, when you, when you look at the, you know, in this modeling process, you look at the, the probability distribution, a lot of the models are extended. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what fraction of the models are. It's certainly not ruled out for it to be extended, I guess. It's, uh, and it, in, in these models, it tends to be extended in the sense of starting a redshift to about 12, 13. And why do you have it starting at, why do you point around 11? Uh, so that's really being driven by the, the CMD data, which you can see there. If I, if I take the, the CMD optical depth and I make the error bar three times less, then I get this shot. Uh, so we also have information coming from high ratio galaxies. So here you're detecting galaxies as dropouts. You see them in some color filters, but not in others. Uh, and by doing that, you get a proxy for the redshift. And you can count up the number of galaxies as a function of their brightness. You find that there are more faint galaxies. Uh, and that's a problem because it also means that you tend not to see all of the star formation. Uh, so here's just a model uh, for the star formation rate, for the full star formation rate and the star formation rate for GWS you can see, see there's quite a significant difference. That's because there's lots of faint galaxies that they're not picking out. So this is challenge that we probably won't see the full uh, population of galaxies in the So you'd like to add uh, constraints on the sort of the cumulative effect of all of the galaxies, which is one way that the 21 centimeter one can use. So there's two ways that one can make use of this, this signal, uh, which ha have analogies to the CMB. So you can make a, a spectral measurement as a function of frequency, as Kobe did, to measure the black body spectrum. Uh, it's black, so it doesn't show up very well yet. And so you can do the same with 21 centimeter experiments single dipole, so you go out and measure the brightness as a function of frequency. This is sort of an analogy that I'll talk about further. Or you can look for fluctuations. So WMAP has been very successful at looking at temperature fluctuations. And one can build into parameters and go after maps of the ionized fluctuations. So I'll talk about both of these in turn. Uh, but first, to just recap some of the basic physics underlying the transition. So the 21 centimeter line occurs because the ground state of neutral hydrogen has a hyperfine splitting associated with the interaction between the proton and the electron spins. They be anti-aligned or aligned. The energy gap corresponds to a wavelength of 21 centimeters, or 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, and it's, as a point of notation, it's customary to describe the occupation numbers of these two states by a spin temperature. So this is just a Boltzmann-like factor. Um, some useful numbers to have in your head are the if you're talking about a signal produced at a redshift of 6, that redshifts to 200 megahertz today. Uh, redshift of 13 to 100 megahertz and redshift of 20 to 70 megahertz. Uh, 70 megahertz is about the lower design specification of the SK. Uh, and these correspond to ages probably the first billion years of the universe, from 1 giga year down to 150 megahertz. 
And those are very comparable to the kind of ages of galaxies at the high stretches that we see. So you really might begin to see properties of the first galaxies. So in a cosmological setting, the idea is to use the cosmic micro background as a backlight. The light neutral hydrogen along the line of sight will imprint a feature at the rest frame frequency, and that redshifts to frequencies around 100 megahertz or so. Uh, so slap bang in the middle of your favorite FM radio station. And RFI is a big challenge for these experiments. So the amplitude of the signal, or the intensity, is measured in units of a brightness temperature. Uh, and it tends to, it, this amplitude of the signal is measured in tens of millikelvins. It depends upon things like the neutral fraction of gas, the baryon density, uh, the peculiar velocities can have an effect. And importantly, this difference between the spin and the CMD temperature. So if this is positive, then you get an emission signal. If it's negative, you get an absorption signal. Uh, and it's important to note that if the spin temperature becomes much larger than the CMD temperature, this factor goes to one, and all dependence on the spin temperature just drops out. So clearly the spin temperature is important, and it can be set by three different mechanisms. You can absorb photons from the tail of the CMD uh, black body, and that tends to equilibrate the spin and the CMD temperature, so this goes to zero and the signal disappears. Collisions can drive the spin temperature to the gas temperature, and resonant scattering ring of Lyman for photons can have the same effect. Uh, because that's fairly important, I'll just go over the details of that. So the idea is that you can be sitting in your hydrogen ground state, uh, say in the bottom level, you absorb the Lyman alpha photon and get excited into the 2p states. From there, you can de excite but going to the other hyperfine state, so that you've induced the spin flip. And there's a couple of channels where you can do that. Part. So this has the net effect of coupling the spin temperature to the color temperature of the radiation field, and via that to the gas temperature. Uh, and the strength of that coupling is, uh, depends upon the amount of line now for the flux that's in. So if you knew what the, so if line alpha photons couple the spin temperature to the gas temperature, so if you knew what the gas temperature was, you'd be able to predict the signal. And we think that at high redshifts, the heating rate is dominated by X-rays. Uh, Lyman alpha heating can also be uh, important, but it's a relatively inefficient process. And so the sort of X-ray sources that you might have are X-ray binaries, so lots of X-ray binaries in star-forming galaxies. You can have inverse quantum scattering of CMB photons of energetic electrons and supernova remnants. We can have accretion onto massive black holes of mini quasars. Um, and at present, there are only relatively weak constraints on what the X-ray background is. Why are X-ray dominated by not just ionized photon? So uh, at these, so early on, the, uh, uh, the photo, the, the, the photons that are energetic enough to photoionize hydrogen are constrained to relatively small bubbles around the first sources, so they don't propagate long distances. X-rays have long mean free paths, so they can keep regions that are tens of megaparsecs away from the source. In, in the present yeah. gap, yeah. In, in, the, in the present universe, photoionization is important, but that's really only true of redshift less than the last uh, So, because we don't know the properties of these first sources, we extrapolate wildly from making the assumption that galaxies at high redshift just look like local galaxies, uh, and that ends up giving about one keV per baryon that gets converted into stars. Uh, and that, you know, the mechanism for this X-ray heating is that energetic X-ray photoionizes hydrogen, producing an energetic electron. That electron then partitions its energy between further ionizations, uh, heating, and you can also end up producing one amount of it. So that electron can excite a hydrogen atom to you know, the n equals three, n equals four state, and when it relaxes by cascades, it can produce one uh, and because 1 EV corresponds to about 10,000 Kelvin, it's very relatively easy to convince. So if we put all that together in, a, in cosmology, then we could begin to ask questions about how the 21 centimeter signal evolves, uh, which I'm plotting down at the bottom here. So initially, uh, you have a phase where the gas decouples from the, the CMB and cools adiabatically. So the gas is cooler than the CMB, uh, but collisions couple the spin temperature to the gas temperature, and that gives you this absorption feature here. Now, as the universe expands, the gas becomes more diffuse, collisions become ineffective, and that signal begins to go away. And then the first stars switch on, 
producing a background of line and alpha photons, and that gives you this second deep absorption function. And that lasts until something heats the gas in these models X-ray heating, and that takes you from an absorption signal up to an emission signal. And then finally, as uh, the universe ionizes, the neutral hydrogen disappears and the signal dies away. So this is kind of a, a basic story that one can tell. But there's plenty of uncertainty due to our uncertainty of the properties of galaxies. Uh, so one can think of alternative scenarios. Uh, perhaps there was no X-ray heating, uh, so the gas just continues to cool, and that will lead you to this very deep absorption property. Perhaps there were shocks or the like, and that can heat you. You might, you, know, you might imagine that you heat the gas early on. Maybe Lyman alpha photons then just get their hosts very effectively due to dust or something, and you get very little signal there. So the shocking is beginning from um, like supernova feedback and like periodic processes, or from just the large structure? The large scale structure is uh, more what I would imagine. So, I mean, people have looked to some extent at uh, sort of the shocks that you get when you get to turn around and matter falls back in again. And that can be a significant input of heat relatively early on. Uh, but the, the temperatures that you get here can become very small, sort of tens of Kelvin. So you might imagine that there are you know, weaker shocks as well produced just by a large scale structure. Uh, in principle, that's something that one could, could simulate. I mentioned it as a possibility. And one that hasn't been explored as much as maybe before. Uh, and one can also imagine exotic physics. So uh, you know, people like to talk about things like dark matter annihilation, dark matter decay, evaporating primordial black holes. The choice is yours. And essentially, the 21 centimeter line at these early stages is acting like a thermometer, enabling you to measure what the IGN temperature is. Uh, so if you have these exotic uh, sources of heat, you can place constraints. So all of this is, is interesting because there are experiments uh, that can be built to me make measurements of this. Uh, up here, a picture of the, the EDGES experiment, which is uh, Judge Bowman and Alan Rogers. So it's just a single dipole experiment that looks at the sky. And in similar sort of fashion to you know, things like COBE, you can flick between the sky and some sort of calibrated source and make an absolute temperature measurement of the, the sky as a country. And there are other experiments at CORE which have been, and I hear there was T-Rex, you say? Yeah. Uh, there's been some effort in this. Now, unfortunately, when you look at the sky, the first thing that you see isn't the signal. The galaxy has plenty of electrons spiraling in magnetic fields, producing radio emission at these frequencies, and that dominates the signal by a couple of orders. So the, the beam of these dipoles tends to be very large. So through a first approximation, you can just ignore the spatial structure and treat the sky as just being uh, a mean value. So then if I plot as a function of frequency of these temperature scales, the foregrounds tend to be quite smooth, uh, whereas the 21 centimeter signal has this uh, stronger spatial structure. Uh, and the hope is that one can use that difference to remove the foreground by fitting a relatively low order polynomial to the foreground and be left with residuals that contain information about the signal. Uh, so just a, you know, as an example of that, if one focuses on the end of reionization, essentially what you're looking at is a, a step. So you go from a neutral uh, IGM to a fully ionized regime. And you can see, you know, just by eye, that if you have a very sharp step, that would be much easier to distinguish from these foregrounds than a relatively uh, extended step. It looks much, much closer to the foregrounds. And so here I'm just taking the Tanch model of realization that's favored by, that's used by WMAP. So the sort of state of the art of the observations at the moment is the EDGES experiment, there was about 50 hours of integration. So here you've got function and frequency, the brightness that they observe. So you have this smooth, diffuse component and a variety of spikes which correspond to radio and television stations. So they're based out in the Australian outback, but at these low frequencies, these signals can be bounced over the, the horizon by the atmosphere. Uh, and you'll also notice that this diffuse compact component doesn't look like a nice, simple power loop. And that's because it's multiplying together the foregrounds and the instrumental frequency response which hasn't been calibrated out by these observations. So you have to fit out both the foregrounds and the instrument response at the same time. Uh, so they, they do that, 
and use it to place constraints on the width of realization of about 0.1 to 0.2 or so. You can see that there are some channels where, uh, which correspond to these radio stations where you have essentially no information. Uh, but it, says, um, it is a rather remarkable thing to decide that one wants a 12-word polynomial to try and get rid of the joke. Uh, uh -huh. You know if they're exploring anything else? I mean, that's you mean as opposed to trying to filter the data in some yeah, more sophisticated it has a little more Yeah, no, I think that's right. And as I said, I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, whereas the, the foregrounds, maybe you could get away with like a third of the polynomial, which is where you'd like to be, you have this, this turnover at the edges of the band, which is coming from the instrumental effect. Uh, so I don't know whether they've looked at anything much more sophisticated than, than fitting the polynomial. Uh, Oh, yeah. It's a. I mean, it's a dipole. I, I don't. They, you know, because it's a dipole, they can't measure the beam very easily. I guess because it's hard to find something that fills the beam. But then, yeah, I don't. I, I don't know about those, those instruments. They're, they're working at uh, calibrating the instrument. So what? Yeah. So so with those kind of things in mind. One question that one can ask is, okay, this is what they, they do at the moment. How well can one hope to do in the future? Uh, and that's something that Arby and I uh, thought about like, looking at. You know, so one can go away and model the sky as you know, some signal plus the foreground. Uh, as good cosmologists, we can write down a Fisher matrix. And we know how to use that to make predictions for errors. And we can test it against you know, things like these squares fitting to show that things agree. And use that to assess where these experiments might go. Uh, so here, for the same Tench model of realization, I'm plotting the redshift of realization and then the duration of realization, and the constraints on, on that model from various sources. So the WMAP optical depth constraint essentially tells you something about when realization took place, but it tells you very little about the duration. So that's this green and the red curve, which are the one and two signals. If you believe that realization is completed by a redshift of seven or so, then you can rule out this yellow region in this model. And then these wiggly curves are the two sigma constraint regions from a edges type experiment integrating for a factor of 10 longer than they achieve, but over the same frequency range. And the different curves are for fitting different orders of polynomial for the foregrounds. So that you can get away with a third order polynomial through to a 12 order. And you can see that as you increase the order of polynomial, you take uh, a significantly smaller bite out of the parameter space. Uh, but in principle, one could use these experiments to say something interesting about uh, the ionization. So what's maybe more interesting than that is that one can also use these to learn about early galaxies uh, by looking for this absorption trap that I mentioned earlier. So in these two figures, uh, I just want to sort of stress the uncertainty in the properties of the galaxies. So here I'm varying the X-ray emissivity assumed for the, these models by four orders of magnitude. And you know, we really are uncertain to that sort of level. And in the bottom panel by the line alpha emissivity. So as you increase the X-ray emissivity, this absorption trough moves to earlier frequencies and becomes much shallower. And that's because you're heating the gas much earlier on. If you increase the line alpha emissivity, it moves to lower frequencies and becomes deeper because you're switching on strong coupling there. And the color coding is just to sort of indicate the re regimes where experiments might, might operate. Uh, as you go to lower frequencies, the ionosphere starts to become a problem. But it's unclear at this moment exactly how, uh, how low in frequency we can go with the ionosphere. OK, so you have all of this variation. And you know, the, the, the evolution of the sources has 
we can make, probably have redshift dependence, and we assume these properties are constant. So one probably wants to focus on key features, like you know, the positions of these turning points in the signal, and then try to get a sense of how well we understand where these, these features are. So this first bit is just a function of cosmology. So we think we understand that fairly well. So if I plot it as a function of the astrophysical parameters, it's just a point in space. This turning point is the point where line and alpha photons switch on. Uh, it really just depends upon the emissivity of the line and alpha photons and gives you a relatively small region. And then this absorption trough depends upon both the heating and the line and alpha coupling. So there's considerable uncertainty as to where that turning point might be. Why did that plot the scale of minus 100 meters and the other labels look like minus 0.1 meters? Oh, so yeah, this is a typo that I haven't corrected. Uh, this, is, this should be Kelvin, yeah, rather than millikelvin. Sorry, that, that, that sneaked in. Yeah, so this is this is 100 millikelvin, 200. And so this this final turning point comes where the the signal gets heat, the temperature of the gas rises high above the CMB temperature, and you get this sort of saturated curve here. And that really mostly depends upon the X-ray. And finally, realization ends. So one can run the excess, uh, you know, so as I say, you know, probably one wants to focus on these physical features and you know, assume that we don't understand the shape of the signal quite so well between that. So one can just interpolate using a spline between them. Uh, and then calculate the sort of constraints that one might expect, uh, again, from an experiment, you know, fitting a third order polynomial for the foregrounds, 500 hours of integration time, between 40 and 100 megahertz. And so these uh, multicolored regions are the range of astrophysical uncertainty. And then these ellipses are the one or two sigma compost for this experiment. So you can see that for things like the, the deep absorption trough, uh, your error bars are relatively large, but still much smaller than the astrophysical uncertainty. So that with a relatively simple experiment, one might hope to begin to exclude some models of uh, properties of early galaxies. Uh, and just to you know, sort of show that in a more user-friendly fashion, by taking that fiducial uh, brightness temperature history and put the same error bars on it, and then the red and the blue curves are varying the extra n line alpha and so by a factor of 10 around. You can see that you might be able to constrain these parameters to uh, order units. So does this assume some sort of uh, uh, homogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous of X-ray background. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And that, so that's clustering, not uh, So in this model, I'm just thinking about the, the sky average signal. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about fluctuations later, and then I'll talk about yeah, yeah. because of course you expect there to be clustering effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, a lot of efforts on the ground for doing this, and one can also think of going into space. Uh, so we have a proposal for the Dark Ages Radio Explorer. So this is you know, essentially the Ages experiment in space orbiting the moon. It's just a simple dipole experiment. You orbit around the moon. Uh, the advantage is when you're on the far side of the moon, you block out radio interference from the Earth. There's no ionosphere to worry about. You can look at the moon to calibrate your, your signal a little better. You can look at the full sky. Uh, that's, that's kind of a fun thing to, to think about. So just to, to summarize what I've said here, that you know, essentially this global signal is accessible with just single dipole experiments. Uh, things like instrumental calibration, foreground removal, major challenges to getting it there. But potentially you could begin to answer some you know, fairly fundamental questions about the thermal ionization is going to be Say something about what the first galaxies are like. And this is very much a field in its infancy, so there's a lot of scope for improving both the experimental and the yeah, analysis techniques. So okay, so that was the global signal. Mm -hmm. And then one can also think about fluctuations in that signal. So as in the case of the CMB, most of the information is in the fluctuations. Um, one can decompose 21 century the brightness fluctuations into several different terms, coming from the density, the neutral fraction, the gas temperature, line alpha flux. And really, this is telling you about how much neutral hydrogen there is at the point and what the spin temperature is at that point. And if you could measure the, and separate these different terms, then you could learn about different aspects of cosmology and astrophysics. 
Now, clearly, if they're all fluctuating at the same time, you won't learn anything about anything. Uh, so we appear to be lucky that, as a function of time, these different bits of physics become important at different times, just based on the, the energetics of the thing. So that at early times, long before the first galaxies formed, you have this collisionally coupled regime where just density fluctuations are important, or predominantly density fluctuations. Then once the first galaxies form, they produce line and alpha halos around them. And what you see is the contrast between the regions where the spin temperature has been coupled to the gas temperature and regions where it hasn't. Then as you get more and more line and alpha photons, everywhere the spin temperature is driven to the gas temperature. And you begin to see temperature fluctuations. Then finally, uh, you know, the gas is very hot everywhere, and you begin to see the contrast between the ionized and the neutral regions. And eventually there's you know, small amounts of neutral hydrogen left over that's the target of some of the intensity mapping experiments that Wavy and others are thinking about. So, you know, maybe three years ago this kind of a cartoon was about the state of the art. Uh, and happily now people have moved forward with more detailed numerical modeling. Uh, one of the, the techniques which is quite interesting is, is semi-numerical modeling. So one can go away and do a, an end body, full end-body simulation and ray trace photons to calculate the ionization field. Um, for these, to understand the physics well, one would like to have very large box sizes and to be able to run those for many different astrophysical models. So you, ideally you want something that you can run quickly. And that's where semi-numerical techniques come. So, so the idea here is that you, you, know, you can make a, a realization of the density field from Gaussian initial conditions, evolve it using the Zeldovich approximation to put in some nonlinearities for the density field. And then it turns out that one can calculate the ionization field from that density box quite accurately using something called the excursion set formalism. So here the idea is that you, you, know, you draw, take a, a pixel of, of gas you draw a sphere around it and you ask the question, does it contain enough galaxies to ionize all of the hydrogen within that sphere? If the answer is yes, it will be ionized. And if it's no, then you draw a smaller sphere and keep going until you either run out of spheres or, uh, and, that, and uh, the gas will be neutral. So in this way, you can get fairly uh, accurate ionization maps quite quickly. You can see that here, this is a semi-numerical, this is a numerical. The large-scale features are quite similar, and it's only on small scales that there's significant disagreement. So you'd like to do something similar to incorporate things like line and alpha and x-ray photons. How do you do So the sort of, I think this is a 100 megaparsecs across, and then the scales of the bubbles are you know, tens of megaparsecs, maybe, kind of moving forward. So you'd like to be able to do something similar for other uh, radiation uh, If you want to do the full radio transfer calculation for line up photons or x-rays, it's numerically very intensive. Uh, and that's something that hasn't really been looked at in great detail yet. Uh, so what one can do instead is try to just to uh, take the kind of analytic calculations and put those into a numerical box. So here you can write down analytically the flux of, say, x-rays. You know, you've got your 1 over r squared. Depends upon the, the emissivity of galaxies at a point, and you've got optical depth effects. And so essentially you're assuming that you can propagate your uh, photons through the mean IGN. And this is just a convolution, so it can be calculated quite quickly. It's quite approximate, but it seems to work reasonably well. Uh, so with Mario Santos, we put this into a simulation box, so I can show you a movie of how the signal will evolve with, with redshift. So initially we start off with these little line and alpha halos around the first galaxies. Over time the uh, signal builds up in strength as an absorption in blue. Then as X-ray heating becomes important around some regions, you get this uh, contrast between cold and hot regions. And over time the gas gets heated further, and those cold regions die away, and you begin to just see the expansion of these ionized regions eating up the, the neutral uh, So there's just four slices from that. So a lot of work has been done on realization simulations. Um, uh, I think it's quite hard to get the dynamic range to have both the sources and the large scales. Uh, somewhere more approximate are these sort of semi-numerical techniques that I talked about. And 
I guess Rajat isn't around, but he has a, a slightly different approach to what And it's just a few groups that are starting to talk about trying to do the full detailed numerical simulation that we like to do to validate the kind of analytic approximations that we're using. And in all of this, having large simulation boxes is, is an important thing. So these are, you know, these are pretty pictures, but as a cosmologist, you'd like to have something quantitative to measure. And the statistic of choice is the power spectrum. So here, uh, one can plot the power spectrum as a function of wave number for the case with uh, line, adding in line alpha fluctuations and adding in temperature fluctuations, and ask what one can learn. So the first thing to note is that adding in line and alpha fluctuations give you extra power on top of the density field. Uh, on the large scales, you're learning something about the clustering of the sources. On the small scales, the density field. On the intermediate scales, you're learning something about the, the emission properties of the galaxies themselves, the uh, frequency spectrum and the like. Uh, and the same is true of X-ray sources with the one difference that it matters whether you're looking at the signal in absorption or emission. Uh, and there are also, uh, so, so if you're looking at an absorption signal and you heat the gas, then that region of gas has a temperature that then becomes closer to the CMD temperature. So you get a weaker absorption signal. If it's in emission and you heat it, you, that temperature is then further from the CMD temperature. So you get a stronger emission signal. So there's a sign difference. Uh, and the difference between, you know, in, in my models, uh, we assume that these sources track galaxies, but if they're really tracking the growth of black holes, for example, then the, the signatures could be redshift dependence of the signatures could be quite different. So one can take the calculations of the power spectrum from line alpha, x-ray, ionization, and put them together. And so here I'm showing the evolution of the power spectrum as a function of redshift. And the different curves are just for different scales. So are trying to compress three-dimensional information into a two-dimensional surface. So that's moderately confusing. But you have basically four regions. This early region above a redshift of about 30 or so, where the power spectrum is just tracking the density fluctuations. A complicated region where you have spin temperature fluctuations. And then a region of realization, and then finally the deadline and alpha of doors. But the thing I wanted to draw out is that if you look at these diagonal lines, these indicate the level of the foregrounds reduced by a factor of 10 to the minus 3 through to 10 to the minus 9. And that's a sort of a measure of how challenging it is to observe the signal. And you can see that if you get down to this 10 to the minus 5 level, that's where you want to live. And that once you're there, measuring the signal during realization of redshifts around 10 it's not much more difficult than measuring the ratios of 20 or so, where spin temperature fluctuations are, just because of the way in which the signal is growing. And it's much more difficult to go after the dark ages of redshifts greater than 30. So that's kind of you know, three dimensions compressed into two. So a much cleaner way of, of seeing that is via a movie. So on the left hand side is a panel taken from a, so this movie is borrowed from Andre Messinger. So on the left hand side you'll see a, a field of the, uh, the fluctuations and on the right hand side the evolution of the power spectrum. So initially it grows as uh, structures grow and you're in this collisionally coupled regime uh, and you know, it tracks the density power spectrum. At some point once the first galaxies switch on it will just shoot up in amplitude, so you see that there. Now it wiggles about as line and alpha and temperature fluctuations become important, drops down a little and then as ionization bubbles grow, it will flatten and then drop down. So you see that over the course of that, there's quite a lot of redshift evolution. And the hope is that if you could sample that at different redshift slices, you could use that as a tool for separating out the contribution of these different components. That's one way you could hope to separate these things out. Uh, another way is to take advantage of redshift space distortions. So this is the same as the sort of Kaiser effect in galaxy surveys. But you're, you make measurements in frequency. Uh, so if you're looking at an over-dense region, if you're looking along the, the, the line of sight, the, the physical depth that corresponds, uh, the physical depth that corresponds to a, a, a given frequency gets flattened. And this produces a, an angular dependence into the power spectrum. So this, these peculiar velocity terms end up looking, being proportional to the over-density 
multiply by this factor of mu, which is the angle between the given Fourier mode and the line of sun. And so when you square this up in the power spectrum, you get these three different terms, uh, which I've plotted here as a function of redshift for just a single Fourier mode. And you can see with these white curves, which are the, the total signal, that each of these different terms evolves quite differently with redshift. And so if you could measure those, that would give you another handle on the different contributions of astrophysics and density. Uh, another one thing that one might look at and that people are beginning to look at is the non-Gaussianity of the signal. So as you begin to ionize the field, so initially you start with a density field, which is close to the Gaussian. But as you start ionizing it, you end up piling up a signal at zero, at the zero mark where gas is ionized. And so this uh, develops a skewness. Uh, and that means that statistics other than the power spectrum, things like the bi spectrum, would be important. Uh, and it's something we're just starting to look at. But it's potentially quite interesting for learning more about the signal. OK, so all of these fluctuations are being targeted by experiments at the moment. It's a number of Pathfinder experiments ranging from LOFAR in the Netherlands, the uh, Murchison Minefield Array in Australia, PAPER, which is being operated in South Africa, I guess, it's a Berkeley project, GMRT, people here are involved in, and SKA, which is planned for the future. So these Pathfinder instruments are really focused at realization of redshift less than 12 or so. Uh, the next generation instruments will go up to higher redshifts, going up to regions of 20 or so. Um, just to show you that they genuinely exist, there's some aerial photos. So MWA is about 32 of these tiles scattered in the Australian outback. They plan to scale up to about 512 tiles over the next couple of years. We have low fire in the Netherlands, where it's very wet, so you have to build a, a hill for your, your instrument. They've got about 18 core stations operating and paper with these various tiles. So they're all able to make maps of the sky and then building up to the point of measuring fluctuations from the nuclear uh, But at the moment, I mean, you know, it's very nice. These are on the verge of collecting data. Uh, GMRT, you probably guys have heard lots about this because people here are involved in it. They actually have some of the first constraints. So you know, this is just taken from the, the paper, you the sky map, you remove the foregrounds, looks like there's nothing left. Zoom in and you get up with these residuals. Most of that is foreground calibration, but it allows you to place some weak constraints on models where the IGN temperature has just been cooling since the very early, early times. So it's just the first step towards getting genuine data. Uh, and sort of, you know, in, in the far future, one might hope to do fundamental physics with 21 centimeter observations to go after cosmology. And then the kind of key thing is that at the moment the constraints that we have come from a very limited volume of space, from this thin slice that's the CMB, or from things like Sloan. And there's a lot of volume in between there that you'd like to fill in to improve your constraints on cosmology. Uh, doing that with the 21 centimeter is challenging because you've got a lot of astrophysics that you need to understand first. Uh, but yeah, possibly any further future that's something. So then just to, to finish up, I mean, I think it's fairly clear that it's going to be a very exciting decade ahead for this field because there are so many different instruments coming online. We currently know very little about the details of how realization happened and what the properties of those galaxies are. And to really understand that process, you need to not just see the sources, but also learn something about the, the gas around them to understand the, the, their emission at different frequencies. One way of doing that is with the 21 centimeter signal, and you've got two ways that you can go after that. One is with this global signal, which I, I described. Uh, there are instruments to collect data from that, but they're very challenging problems in removing foregrounds and calibrating the instruments. And you're really only sensitive to sharp features like this absorption drop, and maybe the end of realization if it's relatively abrupt. But you could hope to constrain the sort of basic features of realization and the evolution of the universe. Uh, complementary that are observations of fluctuations. Uh, so you have this dark ages period, this region of uh, absorption where bio alpha fluctuations might tell you about star formation in the first galaxies, period of heating where you could learn about X-ray sources, and then realization where you can learn about the topology of 
the sort of ionized bubbles. Uh, the first instruments are you know, probing this, collecting data and proving, proving that this can be done. And there are more grandiose plans for moving towards the future and actually imaging these bubbles directly and measuring the power spectrum that the, the chips are going to be Maybe possibilities within cosmology of so increasing the understand the signal increasing the detail. And so that's just the same things that I just said on one slide. So thank you very much for, for listening. It's a good question. Um, I don't have a complete answer to that, I guess. So there are lots of there are, there are a bunch of different ways that you can remove foregrounds, uh, and I guess they depend upon whether you're removing terrestrial radio frequency interference or the galaxy. The galaxy is kind of the bigger challenge. So as far as RFI goes, things like LOFAR have very high time resolution, so they can try to look at the gaps. You know, radio stations aren't on all the time, so they can look in the gaps. Uh, removing galactic foregrounds, the, you need to remove point sources and you need to remove the diffuse component. Uh, for removing the diffuse component, it's, you know, I think people really are talking in terms of fitting out uh, polynomials. I mean, the, in GMRT, I guess they, uh, they break up the signal into many different bins and fit out a piecewise linear model of the foregrounds. Uh, so the, the trick is removing the point sources. Uh, and there the challenge is that when you have a, a very bright point source, uh, which may be 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 times larger than your signal. So when you peel, when you remove that out, you get left with wiggles around that, with uh, residuals from the foreground from the um, And so, yeah, the MWA team, so far from that. Well, well, in terms of removing the spoof component, I think what hasn't been achieved so far relative to the expected signal. I mean, how, can I, how well can I do it right now compared to the spoof component? So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm tempted to say that this might be the state of the art. I don't know if you would agree with that. It's a challenge because uh, you, you'd like to compare with the signal that you're going after, but at the moment the instruments that people have built haven't got the sensitivity to, to get to that level. So MWA are making maps of the sky with 32 tiles and beginning to test that, but I've not seen any published work that, where they, they discuss results. Uh, low far is similarly the same kind of situation. So it's, people have simulations where they can show that you can put in a diffuse background and then remove it out to the level of the signal. But people haven't actually done that with their data. Yeah, so the global step, the forecast we had on the signal constraints was based on 1,000 hours on what, one dipole? 500 hours. 500 hours. 500 hours. 500 hours. But those guys already have thousands of dipoles. We just reprogram the robot dipoles to be a global step. We have that in the millisecond term. Um, yes. Uh, so, so why don't they do that? So one, one challenge of this, I guess, is that you want your, your frequency response to be as smooth a function of frequency as possible. And their dipoles aren't designed for that. So they have resonances which I think would artificially introduce features. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why, why they, they haven't done this in detail. So it would be interesting to talk to them about Because, yeah, integration time scales, one over every 10.